the Virginia Horse Industry Board, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week, we visit Zach Grandel at Plains Mill in Timberville. Grandel is in the process of restoring the grist mill as well as creating a distillery that would be powered by the same water. Then Mark Viette has tips on pruning winter damage when we go in the garden. Plus, we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this and the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. School lunches have evolved over the years, but chicken has been an enduring component. The popular protein is offered in a variety of forms and flavors, but USDA Foods is now offering an unseasoned chicken strip to provide school nutrition professionals with a versatile and healthy option to add to their recipes. The new product works in salads, wraps, burritos, and stir fries, among other dishes. While the lower sodium content and the easy to use strips assist schools in meeting new meal pattern requirements. All states will be able to order the product for schools to serve this spring. Well, that chicken and other poultry products will soon be safer to eat, thanks to the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Services proposal for new federal standards to reduce salmonella and campylobacter, which lead to foodborne illnesses. For chicken parts, ground chicken, and ground turkey, FSIS is proposing a pathogen reduction performance standard designed to achieve at least 30% reduction in illnesses from salmonella and a 37% reduction from campylobacter. FSIS also plans to use routine sampling throughout the year rather than infrequently sampling on consecutive days to assess whether establishments processes are effectively addressing the bacteria. In this segment from the American Angus Association, we find out what premiums for end meats mean for the consumer. Cindy Campbell explains why beef grades matter beyond the steak. T-bones, sirloins, fillets, and strips. Those middle meats make up 12% of the carcass, but nearly half its total value. That and the difference in cooking method lead many to believe it's the only place where beef grades matter. Not according to longtime earner Barry Market reporter Bruce Longo and the data he tracks. Over about 50% of the, of the carcass happens to be either the chuck or the round or known as end cuts. So it's imperative that they, the end cuts get some, some life, get some play, get some retail activity. And, it, and also we see that from, from food service. Over the last five years, the spread between certified Angus beef brand and USDA choice carcass values has jumped roughly 30% with much of that increase represented by premiums for end meats and grinds. That shows there's value in higher quality grades, even when it's not a steak, Longo says. The benefits of recognizable brands might be even more apparent in the current market dynamics. Yeah, beef prices are high. We've, we, we know that beef prices are gonna be high for a little bit. We'll see some relief out in a couple of years, but we've reached some levels that, that the consumers have never seen before. What gets overturned by using a premium cut is really the eating experience. Really understanding when they, when they go into um, a, a better steak, a better quality steak, the eating experience and the customer comes away and saying, you know, that was worth the money spent. So, uh, you know, while consumers are, are focused on their budgets, okay, and we're all budget conscious in all of our families, um, sometimes the eating experience will outweigh the, the, the monetary concerns. Both surveys and studies of recent economic downturns prove that point. We know from research that consumers are willing to pay more to get the quality that they desire in beef. In fact, what we see even in economies where um, recession is taking place where folks don't have as much to spend is that there's a willingness in certain product categories to actually spend just a bit more 
to ensure that that eating experience is going to be there. And fortunately, high quality beef, beef is one of those. That signal makes its way back to cattlemen who act to produce more of the cattle that are in demand. And it all starts when consumers vote with their pocketbooks. So folks are willing to put down a little bit more money at the meat counter and at the restaurant to get a product they know is going to perform. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thanks, Cindy. The Virginia Cooperative Coyote Damage Control Program works to help farmers resolve coyote predation problems, something that is essential for those who have lost livestock to coyotes. So essential, in fact, that currently a budget amendment is on the table that would restore the Commonwealth's portion of the state and federal program that helps Virginia livestock producers suffering from the coyote depredation. USDA Wildlife Services, which runs the program, provided direct control services to 195 livestock farms in 53 Virginia counties last year. During that time, 285 sheep, 81 calves, and 32 goats were verified killed by coyotes on those farms. That represents a 39% increase in reported sheep predation and 69% increase in reported calf predation from fiscal year 2013. Well, a Virginia man is restoring a historical gristmill with plans to make local flour, cornmeal, and related products. His plans also call for a water-powered distillery to make Virginia whiskey and bourbon. We'll visit with Zach Grandel at Plains Mill in Timberville. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. We're here today in Timberville, Virginia at Plains Mill. It's a historic site and I'm joined by owner Zach Grandel. Zach is planning on restoring this to its original grist mill that's powered by water as well as a distillery that's also powered by water. Zach, thanks so much for having us out today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for coming out. So my first question is, I want you to give me a little bit of history about this, this property. Absolutely. The, the mill you see behind us was built in 1847. Um, by Dr. Solomon Hinkle from Newmarket, Virginia. Um, and the Hinkles uh, were the, the millers here. The Hinkle family um, were millers here until the early 1900s. Um, this mill was built in 1847, survived the Civil War. Um, previously, there was a mill that was built here in 1774 um, by Colonel Matthew Harrison um, and his wife. And it was built here to take advantage of the, the large flow of water from the Plains Mill Spring, which you can, which is, you can see flowing past this, which powers the mill. Um, and then also, the, uh, the Plains area was known for its agriculture. Um, it's a real flat land, um, and it's where we'll, we'll get our, our uh, grains from for the distillery and also for the milling uh, businesses we have on site. So what inspired you to purchase this property? I'm a local guy. I grew up here locally in, in Broadway, Virginia. Um, the, the mill is only about five miles from where I grew up. Um, for me personally, there's a, a, a really deep history with the property. Um, there's some things for the distillery that are very attractive to me. Um, first of all, it's not registered historic yet. I'm in the process of putting on the state and national registry. So that lets me fix up the property how I would want to do it instead of you know, having to take over somebody else's project. Um, so that was appealing to me. The water source for the distillery is perfect for, for bourbon and for spirits. Um, so being able to use that in the, in the process was uh, very attractive to me. And the local agriculture, um, you know, it's surrounded by this great agriculture land. So, you know, the, the area and the, the proximity to Interstate 81, it's so to, to bring tourists in relatively easy. I want to talk a little bit about distilling spirits. What ingredients does it take and where will you get those ingredients from? The best part about this area in the distillery will be the, 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 the agriculture that's in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, you know, you, you really, we have access to so many great agriculture, grains, uh, wood for the, for the barrels to age it in, the water, um, everything here is, is all going to be sourced local. Um, so I'll use the, the corn from across the street. Uh, I'll use corn, rye, barley, and wheat uh, for, for what I intend to make here, uh, which will be bourbon, uh, whiskeys. Um, and then there's other types of spirits that we can play around with. Uh, being a craft distiller, you have a little bit more play um, and to have a little bit more fun. I can do seasonal fruits um, with local orchards. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. But, but mainly the, the most important thing is the ingredients. The local fresh, the fresh water, the, the fresh ingredients is, is really what's going to make the spirit. So this
this distillery will be powered by this water, the water wheel behind us. Is that unique? They are now. Um, there's only, from my knowledge, there's only one other water powered distillery in the country, um, and that's George Washington's distillery at Mount Vernon, which uh, they just reopened a few years ago. Um, so that distillery and this distillery will be very unique in, in that it's, it's water powered, um, a grist mill with a distillery. Um, but that's the way that, that they would do it in the, the early 19th century, 18th century. Um, typically, they would have a sawmill, a distillery, and a, a grist mill um, in an, an operation like this. And actually, in, in some of the old deeds, uh, it makes reference to a distillery. And in some of the old Hinkle journals, uh, we found references to distilleries here and then also local distilleries as well. So the two distilleries in the nation that are powered by water are actually right here in Virginia. Yeah, that's as far as I know, that's there was one in uh, Indiana called Indian Creek. I believe it's Indian Creek. Um, but the, the water-powered grist mill is no longer in operation. They just have a distillery now. So, yeah, it'll be very unique. I'm really excited. Tell me about your experience when you saw the property. You kind of knew that's what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But walk me through what happened when you saw that original deed. Yeah. Um, so the Hinkle family, Siren P. Hinkle and Dr. Solomon Hinkle, um, they were immaculate record keepers, and they kept daily journals, daily day books from the mill, ledgers, um, and things that we actually still have access to. The family has copies of these original books. Um, there's, there's copies of the Sauron P. Hinkle journals as volumes um, in the Library of Virginia. So we have access to go back and look at these, these books and records, um, and we can go back as we're fixing up the mill, um, we can go and see what, you know, where they quarried the the rock and where they got the lumber from. Um, so we have all these different resources as far as the history that we know. Um, along with that, uh, the water rights, at one point there, this was a 965 acre farm. Um, and the spring, the water from the spring was on the farm. Throughout time, pieces of the farm has been sold off. The water rights still remain with the property. Um, so as the chain of deed evolved through the 1800s till today, the water rights are actually deeded to the property so that nobody upstream could, could stop the water or take water out. Um, and through those deeds, it, it mandates what those people could use the water for. Um, and in, in, in an 1810 deed, which uh, some descendants of the Hinkles, the Reynolds family who actually live across the street, um, they have a copy of an 1810 deed. And in that deed, it says that specifically that the water can only be used outside of the mill um, by anyone else for, for the mill. Um, the water can only be used to, uh, for household use for, uh, for livestock, cattle, and for a distillery. And it specifically said that in, in the original deed, um, which, you know, you read that kind of stuff and, you know, 200 years later, here I come along and, and to my knowledge, I can't find actual proof that there was a distillery here one can assume that there was at some point along the river. Um, but for me, that's, you know, it just gives me chills to think that, that something 200 years ago is actually coming to life now. So the distillery is part of the business, but you're also going to be operating a grist mill. What kind of products are you going to make using the grist mill? We'll get everything restored to be water powered. Um, and like I said, we had most of the equipment, original equipment still inside. Um, what I'll do is we'll restore that get it cleaned up. We'll have daily milling demonstrations where we can bring people in and show them how a typical 19th century milling operation was. This is one of the larger mills in Rockingham County. Um, they would ship flour all the way to Baltimore, Richmond, um, and all over the eastern United States. Um, so we'll bring people in, show them how they used to, to mill. Um, and from that, we can make uh, flour, cornmeal, um, different types of raw baking goods mixes, um, which we'll, we'll have here. We'll have a general store on site, and then we'll also distribute to local restaurants, um, local stores, uh, local bakers, um, hopefully, and, and really get the community involved and have let them have access to their local, their local produce and local grains. You can't get much more local or fresh than that, and the local fresh movement is really big right now. Do you see that contributing to your success in the future? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the restaurants, a lot of restaurants are starting to go local and, and they're looking for resources such as a mill um, where you can get fresh stone ground, uh, you know, cornmeal, flour, stuff that they use every day. Um, there's also going to be a lot of byproducts from the distillery, 
which we're excited to partner with local farmers to actually um, use use the byproducts. So the spit mash, um, the grains, there's actually still nutritional value um, for the animals, for the livestock. So you can add that to hay and donate that to local farmers. Um, and in turn, you know, they could be raising uh, hogs, livestock, uh, cows, chicken. Um, they can be raising other things that, you know, could be used in a, a local restaurant or even if we would do a restaurant here on site somewhere down the road. So let's talk about job creation here in the Commonwealth. This is a big place. It certainly can't run itself. About how many employees do you plan on hiring? At least five. At least five full-time employees. Um, certain There's certain aspects of the distilling operation that are, are very intensive. You know, the, the record keeping, the taxation, um, things that, you know, we're going to need people on it full-time. Um, the sales, the distribution, um, there's, there's opportunities there. There's opportunities for a miller, you know, a head miller to come in and, and work here full time. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many different jobs. You're creating a true agritourism destination here. What are your plans for this entire place? Hopefully a lot cleaner. Um, I kind of found it, you know, it's, it's, it's been pretty much uh, you know, untouched and, and uh, dirty for about 13 years. So it's been, a, it's a vacant building. Um, so cleaned up, uh, we look to get it cleaned up, polished up. Um, the original mill, I'd like to look as original as possible based on the old photographs that we have. Um, I am looking to have some new construction for the retail area, the tasting rooms, um, to put bathrooms in and bring everything up to code. Um, so there will be some new construction, but you know we wanna kind of have that in kind, similar in kind, where it looks and it fits along with the original buildings as much as possible. Again, everything will be water powered, and I'd like to keep it that way. It'll be a very uh, green and energy efficient um, and water powered industry. You know, I'd like to have this a uh, family friendly um, as possible to bring, be able to bring in uh, school schools for uh, to do tours and field trips and things like that. Um, I could understand, you know, some people may not want their child to, to go through a distillery, and that's perfectly understandable. You know. So it will be separate, the distillery will be completely separate from the milling operation. Um, and, and we like to keep it that way to, to allow everybody to come in and some people will be interested in one thing and may not be interested in another and we'll give them the opportunity to, to pick and choose. If people want more information about Plains Mill, where can they go? Uh, we have a website, uh, www.plainsmill.com. Um, people can go there and find out more about the, the restoration project that we've got going on um, with the original mill as well as the distillery. Um, the event area and, and everything else. So we have a, our website, plainsmill.com, and then we've also got a Facebook page uh, that we, we keep updated with new content. Uh, and it's Plainsville uh, on Facebook, Timberville, Virginia. Okay. Thanks so much for having us out today. Absolutely. And we certainly wish you luck with everything you have going on. Thank you. We'll be right back. Heavy winter snow and ice can take a toll on your trees and shrubs. Mark Viette has tips on pruning that winter damage. Let's go in the garden. My favorite flowering shrub, the butterfly bush, is great to put all over your garden. But on those cold winters, we've noticed many of them die back or in some cases completely die and do not show any new growth. A couple things to remember, do not prune butterfly bushes in the fall. Ideal time to prune them is in April. Warmer areas, early April. Colder areas like the Blue Ridge Mountains, maybe mid-April. But I did learn something. My favorite way of pruning butterfly bushes is to prune them right to the ground, one to two inches from the ground. My dad, on the other hand, pruned them 24 inches above the ground. I'm gonna show you in a minute ones that were pruned to the ground, but you can look at this one here. It is dead. And if you look close at the base, you see a lot of old stubby growth, uh, stems three to four inches in diameter, and no new growth. This we have to replace. Let me show you one that I pruned and how well it's come back in the garden. You may not see the damage on butterfly bushes till May, June, 
maybe the beginning of July. But again, always keep in mind, you do want to trim them back if you can sometime during the month of April. Could be as late as May if need be. And what we would do is we would come in and remove any parts that are dead like this, which have been pruned. Usually I recommend a really good heavy duty loppers. But this is a butterfly shrub that is coming back. And if you look, it has been cut quite low to the ground. Try to cut it as low to the ground that is safe for you using any kind of tools and you will find that there's a lot of basal growth, a lot of growth in the ground that comes up every year where a lot of the growth that's above the ground can freeze and be injured during those cold winter months. Crate myrtle can be as short as 18 inches or 50 feet plus. This is one of my favorites. This one is called Sioux. And as you can see, it gets about 25 to 30 feet. You can also choose the hardier varieties like Sioux. This one has not burned back with cold winter temperatures as of yet. Then you can also have some crepe myrtles like this one, which only get four or five feet tall. And with this type of crepe myrtle, you prune them to the ground every three or four years, maybe anywhere from three to six inches. Now let me show you a crepe myrtle that had lots of winter damage. Now this crepe myrtle got blasted with the winter temperatures. So it does pay to look for the super hardy types that you can buy. And in this case, sometime in May, end of May, it's usually when you can determine if they're alive or dead. Sometimes we'll take a little knife and scratch the bark just to check to see if there's any green on each bark. Uh, but really, by this time, you can see some growth coming out of the base. My recommendation is to prune this crepe myrtle low to the ground from three inches to maybe six inches above the ground, and now you can get ready for your workout. You could use all these old branches in your compost pile, and really what you're trying to do is prune back to new growth. And I would possibly come in and prune these maybe half again farther to the ground. And you can see here all the nice new growth that you've got. So if you get those hard winters, just get out there, prune the dead out, and then you can enjoy your plants for a couple years till we get those hard, cold winters again. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the ag calendar, VSU's Beginning Farmer Program is hosting a workshop at various locations throughout the Commonwealth. This introductory workshop is designed for beginning farmers and ranchers to establish and sustain viable agricultural operations through whole farm planning programs. Please visit the website for further information and registration details. The Small Farm Outreach Program at Virginia State University's College of Agriculture is presenting two informational sessions to help you make decisions for your farm and farm practices that may be impacted by the 2014 Farm Bill. Topics include yield update, base acre allotment, NAP insurance, and buy-up. The staff will also guide you through the Farm Bill Toolbox, an online resource that takes you step-by-step -step through the decision-making process. To register, contact Mark Klingman. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.
Check out Virginia Farming on Facebook. Virginia Farming's Facebook page is a great way to stay connected with Virginia agriculture. You might even find some humor there too. You'll find links to events and happenings all over the Commonwealth that are of interest to farmers and consumers alike. So connect with us and share your stories and photos with the Virginia farming community and keep up to date on all things agriculture. Virginia Farming on Facebook. We all want healthy rivers and streams, but we can't do that without help from Virginia's landowners. Resource Management Plans, or RMPs, are part of a voluntary program that helps farmers get credit for cleaning up our waters. And once you have an RMP, you are exempt from any new water quality requirements for nine years. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation has funds available to help you implement these plans. Contact the department today to learn more. Thank you. This message sponsored by Virginia's agriculture community.